Hi everyone, really hope you're enjoying the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Invisalign Clear Aligners. Do it for you and do it right. This sounds like a motto all of us goalkeepers know a lot about. I'm over halfway through my Invisalign journey and I've always been a bit self-conscious about my smile. I got a personalized treatment plan from a trusted doctor and the peace of mind knowing that Invisalign aligners are based on years of research and experience from millions of patients worldwide. But the improvements have been so much quicker than I could have imagined. I'm seeing my smile change weekly like the Premier League table. Doing it right involves choosing the world's most advanced clear aligner system. The number one doctor recommended clear aligner brand trusted by 16 million people worldwide. Do it for you. Straightening your teeth with the Invisalign treatment means investing in yourself. Hand in hand or glove in glove, you get the expertise of an Invisalign provider. Now let's dive back into the podcast. Current Tottenham and Jamaican goalkeeper, Becky Spencer, welcome to the show. I played for a boys team up until probably the age of maybe under 12. And then I got scouted for Arsenal and that's probably where obviously my career turned around at a young age. When I was in under 10s at Arsenal, I had Emma Byrne, who was the first team goalkeeper at Arsenal, who was my goalkeeping coach. Just to be able to say that I made my debut for, for Arsenal yes. at the age of 14 is something I'll always be proud of. Yeah. And I was like, I need to come home, like I'm done here. And then I came back and went to Birmingham and I think that was the, the move for me that kind of shaped where I'm at now. Obviously you won the Euros, you didn't let a goal in the whole tournament. That was really hard to take, so I thought if I just rehab it and see how it goes, and that's when I moved to Chelsea after that. No goalie. Don't know why? I don't know why. West Ham obviously came calling, they were new to the league, and I went there, and that was a tough, real tough move for me. So when I joined Spurs, they just got promoted into the WSL. I got my call up for Jamaica, and I haven't looked back, I've enjoyed every single minute. We just went to the World Cup and we just went for it. Yeah. And we just had nothing to lose and we just believed in each other. Us as players had to stand together to try and stand up for something for the next generation coming through. What a save from Mark Howard. Hi guys, I'm thrilled to share something with you today. The Mito Pro 300 from Mito Red Light Therapy. Been a game changer. As an athlete, I know the importance of peak performance and recovery. And that's why I rely on the Mito Pro 300 for its unparalleled benefits. Let's dive in to what makes the Mito Pro 300 remarkable. First off, it's all about power. And this device offers 300 red and near infrared light benefits. These wavelengths penetrate deep into your cells helping to jumpstart the natural process of recovery and rejuvenation. But it's not just about the numbers, it's about results. The Mito Pro 300 is designed for maximum efficiency. It emits light evenly and directly onto your body, ensuring every inch benefits from this therapeutic light. You might be thinking, why should I choose the Mito Pro 300? Simple, it's a game changer in a world of light therapy. The award-winning quad wavelength design updated with remote control technology. Toggle up and down on the timer, reset unit settings, and operate multiple units with the same remote. If you're dealing with the aches and pains of an active lifestyle, or simply someone looking to improve your overall well-being, the Mito Pro 300 is your solution, and it's versatile. Use it for targeted spot treatments or full body therapy sessions. The choice is yours and the benefits are undeniable. Plus it's easy to use. Just plug it in, set your treatment time, and relax. There's no steep learning curve, no complications. With the Mito Pro 300, you're not just investing in a device. You're investing in your health, your well-being, and your performance. Don't wait. Discover the incredible benefits of the Mito Pro 300 for yourself. Visit mitoredlight.com and take the first step towards a better you. Hit the link in the description below. Now let's dive back into this episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard. Uh, I'm really excited about today's guest. I've got current Tottenham and Jamaican goalkeeper, Becky Spencer. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. And I know we've been speaking for a while to try and get you on the show. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I, I've been following you for a while now and I wanted to, to tell your story on the podcast. Uh, you've, you've had quite an adventure of a career so far. Yeah. Um, obviously, I started off. I think I must have been about, I want to say like six. Um, and my brother-in-law at the time, he used to uh, coach Wembley FC boys team. And he used to play for Wembley FC men's team. And um, my sisters all played football as well for Wembley. So, um, yeah, I played for a boys team up until probably the age of maybe under 12s. Yeah. 
Um, and then I got scouted for Arsenal and that's probably where obviously my career turned around at a young age and ever since I've just been going at it so it's yeah. been a real it's been a real journey um, I won't tell you how many clubs I've been at but um, yeah <laughs> I, I'll, I'll top trump you with that yeah. don't worry about that <laughs> right uh, I've got a, a couple of quick fire questions just to get to know you break you into the, the show yeah. and that right uh, nice and easy to start off with catch or parry catch yeah you're old school aren't you yeah. <laughs> right, tea or coffee tea uh, play it short or kick it long Sure. We were talking before, we you, you uh, were talking a lot about this before. Was, yeah. You love playing out from Def, the back, yeah. yeah I do, do you reckon like that's it. from your upbringing? Obviously being a bit of an, an outfielder, but also coming through at Arsenal, you just yeah. taught that way. Yeah, um, at Arsenal, that was kind of like the main thing. And obviously you see now, you know, throughout all of, you know, the Arsenal as a club itself, that's the, how they play football. And um, yeah, they was never short of putting me out on pitch when I was, when I was training. And uh, they just used to get me involved in a lot of possession stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I definitely learned that from from Arsenal for sure. Yeah, like we were speaking before, but obviously working with Alex Welsh. I don't know if that... So I was one of the first goalies. I used to turn up to outfield training yeah. without my gloves. Yeah. So I used to do my training with Alex Welsh as a goalkeeper on a, like on a Monday and a Wednesday night. And then I'd go to the outfielder training on a Tuesday and Thursday night mm. in the old JVC centre. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't take my gloves and I'd turn up and I'd be like, right, we'll do shooting. I was like, I ain't got gloves. So oh, I've got to play out field. Can't do it, yeah. So like Alex used to buzz off here because yeah. it was like, I was cheeky, like proper like South London. I like yeah. didn't care. I was like, this, this is how I'm going to get better. Yeah. I'm surprised Alex didn't have you catch him without your gloves though. Oh, he, he did, like, yeah. He did yeah, that. He we did a couple one. of sessions like <laughs> that. Right. Uh, who's your favourite ever goalkeeper? Um, Santiago Canazares. Yes, what um, a keeper. Yeah. Madman as well. I used to love it. Um, I used to watch a lot of Spanish football growing up. My dad loves football, so he used to watch whatever football was on the TV. And it was back in the day, obviously, when Barcelona were so dominant and Valencia, I used to love watching him. Like, yeah. he was just crazy. Just everything about him, I used to love it. And I think I used to wear the same boots as him and try and tuck my shirt in like him. Obviously, I didn't dye my hair. Dye so hair kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And go for the short back and sides. But no, um, yeah, I just really loved like, how he was. and. Yeah his confidence and just how he kind of what he brought to the to the game he always looked like he just didn't care as well yeah. which is an unbelievable trait as a goalie yeah and he just enjoyed it looked like he was just yeah, enjoying yeah, yeah. it all the time so I think that he's definitely my favourite goalkeeper yeah nice that's the first time I've had someone say that yeah. that's, that's a great answer <laughs> uh, starter or dessert oh, dessert yeah right. uh, long sleeve shirt or short sleeve shirt I know this answer short sleeve, short sleeve yeah. yeah right and uh, favourite stadium you've ever played at it's got to be gonna, one of World Cup ones, isn't it, for the atmosphere and yeah, stuff? Yeah, the atmosphere. Because if we're going to go for stadium, I would say the Tottenham Hotspurs because that stadium is unreal. It's incredible. Um, but I'd say the stadium in Sydney um, at the World Cup, that was amazing. The yeah. atmosphere was incredible. It was really, really incredible there. So I would say, yeah, two different for different reasons. Class, right. And then finally, right, it's the, the last minute of a game. You either save a penalty to guarantee the win or you can go up and score a goal. What are you doing? I think doing? I'm going for the winner. You go for a goal. I yes, I love it. I love that. I think I'm going for the winner. You yeah. have to score a goal. <laughs> We've all dreamt about it. We have. And I think, why are they put me in the box for? I'm five foot five. <laughs> I ain't going to win a header. They might get the second bit. Or and... bicycle kick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah nice. <laughs> right. Uh, like, as I was saying, right, uh, how you got into goalkeeping, I read a lot about like your sisters and your parents having a huge influence on you. Yeah. It's so vital that you have like the, the parents supporting you and being yeah. willing to take you everywhere. And like, for any of the younger listeners now, they must appreciate your parents. Yeah, I mean, because I think it's, it's it's really hard because you don't see it until you're older. Um, the amount that parents put into, you know, your career and wanting you to do well and making sure that you're happy and yeah. making sure that you're cared for in those scenarios. And yeah, I can't thank my parents enough. Like from the age of, like I said, it must have been about six. They've been like traveling up and down the motorway, taking me to football. And then when I did start driving, they still would come with me to games to watch. Um, so finally, I think they've, they've got their rest now. I say to them in certain games, I'm like, yeah, you don't need to come to this one. But they've been my biggest supporters yeah, yeah for my whole career. So every, I've got everything to thank them for, basically. Yeah. Uh, and your competitive edge comes from playing against your sisters then? Yeah, so my sisters all played. I've got three sisters. Um, yeah. I've got a brother as well, but he's actually a chef. He used to play as well, but he's a chef. But oh, um, perfect for making pretty much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I just remember that we used to just go up the park and there was just one time they to shove me in goal and I think it's because I was only little and they've it's a big age gap between me and my sisters so um they just shoved me in goal and I just remember like diving around and they're like oh you was all right in there and I was thinking to myself I don't really want to do that but then I started to enjoy it and I definitely get my competitive edge from them yeah. like they were incredible like I used to be mascot for their team they used to play for Watford and I used to be mascot for every game and I used to love walking out of my sisters thinking I was That's so cool yeah. and just like watching them play and 
yeah, so even that, like, they're my supporters as well. Like, they support and they come and watch as many games as possible. So Amazing. I do love all of that. Yeah. See, the, the like, being the younger child then and yeah. getting chucked in goal, that's where every, most goalkeepers you'll find. It's like yeah. you went in the garden and your older brother or sister bullied you, you chuck, so chucked you in goal. But then you realise that you're, like, a bit special, you're a bit different. Yeah. And, like, that's where, like, the affinity comes from of, like, loving playing in goal is that... If you get if you get the ball in the face and they go oh you're right and you go yeah I'm alright yeah like yeah. and you crack on but like yeah. I think it does come from like those sort of grounded sort of things of like the sibling rivalry but you yeah. you realise that you're different yeah you've got I think you've definitely got to be a different breed because even now like when I speak to like outfield players when we're training there'll be like a session where like we're doing a lot of blocking and stuff and they're like how do you enjoy that. And I don't even have the answers for it because I'm just like, I don't know. Like, we're just, we're just used it's to just it in now. You, isn't it? It's just in us, like, yeah. just to want to do that. So I think it's just uh, definitely those situations when I was younger did help me because you just end up fearless and you just end up being very brave. And, you know, they just didn't care. If yeah. I was getting whacked around, they just like get on with it kind of thing. Like, tough it's, love. it's still not enjoyable though when you're doing cutbacks from six oh, yards, is it? Not. And you've got that's to go and spread. Loss. That's a head. That's a head loss one for me. It's just not a goalkeeper <laughs> session. It's no. for the strikers. That's what you have to keep telling yourself: is just don't get hurt. It's not yeah. for me. Yeah. Right. Uh, and obviously, uh, I want to talk a little bit about you getting into football and obviously being a female. But like, yeah. the route must have been harder than it. It's getting easier. Sorry. I mean, yeah. it's getting easier now to get into football. There's a lot more girls' teams, and it's yeah. a lot more. Obviously, with the success of the English team. Yeah. And the funding has kicked on massively. But when you started, it wouldn't have been the same as that. Yeah, no. Um, I know a lot of people that had to play in boys' teams first because there was no yeah. girls' teams around. And if there was girls' teams, it wasn't accessible to get to or you'd have to be in an academy. Yep. Um, and when I played for Wembley, I was playing for Watford at the same time. So I was doing a bit of both. And I think playing with the boys did help as well with like the physicality elements and and stuff like that. So it's, it's difficult. Um, it was really difficult, actually. Um, and then until you get picked up, then you realise that there is a pathway. And I think now there's a lot more girls teams, which there do, does need to be more. Yep. Um, just to make it accessible for everyone to get to. And because obviously some people don't have parents that can take them here, there and everywhere. So just to make sure that it's there for them, on you know, on London transport or whatever transport you need to take, just so people can get there. Um, because a lot of my teammates used to take the bus a lot and used to have to get on the tube and, and stuff just to get to training. And yeah. you think about it now and I think, God, it's wild. And then you'd go to school the next day. Mm. But obviously we love doing, you know, we love playing football. So we would do whatever it took to, to kind of get there. Yeah. Um, but for now, I think, um, you know, with the success of the Lionesses, you know, it's been it's been welcomed because it's shone a, shone a light on, yeah. you know, that there wasn't much you know, for females to, to actually go and play football and in goalkeeping especially, there's still a, a massive lack in that and there's a big gap where we need to start bringing in, you know, young goalkeepers from a younger age. Yeah, so. and obviously the the specialised goalkeeper coaches, that needs to obviously be more readily available yeah. from a younger age because you, you do find that it will be like the assistant manager that will just take you through a little bit of a warm up or there's yeah. not an actual training session you can go to, but yeah. obviously that is improving now. Yeah, because I was fortunate enough when I was in under 10s at Arsenal, I had Emma Byrne, who was the first team goalkeeper at Arsenal, who was my goalkeeping coach. Um, and that worked. Um, but then obviously once I moved on to the other age groups, I was getting goalkeeping coaching. But then I transitioned into senior football at the age of 14. And so early yeah, as well. Yeah, really early. And we didn't have a goalkeeping coach. So me and Emma never had a goalkeeping coach per se. So we would basically be serving to each other and putting our own kind of warm ups on, which was fine at the time. But if we were to do that now, we wouldn't be able to get away with it because we would need more. Yes. Because um, the game's obviously moved on from that now. So yeah. obviously at the time it was fine. And obviously with Alex coming in every now and again, it helped. But, you know, when you just, you're just begging just to have someone in every day just to give us, you know, what we need. Um, but we made we made do of what we had. And obviously we were really successful at that time. So I won't complain. And Emma was a, a great mentor for me. Yeah, I want to speak a little bit about obviously getting scouted for Arsenal, but breaking in so early. Yeah. You, you must feel like you've almost gone through two careers already because you started so, so young, early. especially as a goalkeeper. You normally yeah. find that we develop slightly later. and Yeah, it was um, it was hard because obviously I was at, um, I worked my way up from the under-10s onwards at Arsenal. So I spent the majority of my career there and it was a club that I always wanted to be at and it was like a home for me to be there. Um, and I got into the under-14s and I remember getting called up to the first team and training with, you know, all of these players. I had like Kelly Smith and Alex Scott and all of these players, Rachel Yankee. And I was thinking, oh God, okay, I need to actually grow up and whatever. Um, but they were very understanding that I was only still four, like 14 and, you know, still playing at Centre of Excellence football on the weekend as yeah. well. So I was doing a lot of training. So 
I'd have to train with the academy and then I'd have to train with the first team and then have a game on a Saturday and then be in the squad for a Sunday game. Wow. Um, and obviously I was on the bench, but I was only 14, so it was normal. I was just really happy to, to be there. And I remember when I got given my first game, it was um, Sunderland away. A long old trip on the coach. That is. It was <laughs> it's like a long trip hours. on the coach. And I remember my parents dropping me off to the training ground and um, Vic Akers, who was the manager at the time, was like, I'm going to give her you know, her debut in this game. Like I'll, I'll put her on. And I didn't know anything about it until I got there. And um, I think we was winning like 2-1 or something like that. And he was like, Bex, are you ready? And I was like, no. And I was literally shaking. I was thinking, oh my God, I'm actually going on. Um, and I went on, we won the game 3-1 from what I remember. And um, I think I only had like a little bit to do, but just to be able to say that I made my debut for, for Arsenal yeah. at the age of 14 is something I'll always be proud of. Yeah, that's an incredible achievement, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Like even like <laughs> you're saying it and you've lived for it, but like it's incredible yeah. to hear and it is inspiring. Yeah. It's, uh... But it's like what's amazing is you got fast track that quickly and they obviously saw the talent in you anyway and had yeah. faith in you. And that don't happen a lot. Yeah, because, you know, as a youngster, I was always kind of in centre of excellence football. I was in the England team at the time. So I, was, I went through all the England under 15s, under 17s, under 19s. Yes. And I was pushed up to the under 19s pretty quickly as well. Um, and I was always kind of tipped to be one of the best goalkeepers that was going to be. And I don't know whether I kind of felt like I'd underachieved in certain moments or whether I had outstayed my welcome at clubs for too long where I wasn't playing, um, which kind of hindered that or, you know, there was just something that was a little bit off. And I think I started to realise, obviously being at a club for so long, you don't get the game time that you want. And obviously I'm still young. I'm fighting against Emma Byrne, who's a world-class goalkeeper. And it's I'm at the best club, you know, arguably one of the best clubs in the world at the time. And I'm just like, I need to find a way in, but I can't. I didn't know anything about loans and stuff yeah. like that at this point. Yeah. So I'm like just going through it and I'm just enjoying it. And I think that was like a turning point where I think I hit like 21, 22, where I'd sat on the bench for quite a while and I'd get certain cup games and stuff like that, but it wasn't enough. Yeah. Um, and I went on loan to, I went on loan to Birmingham um, I'm not sure if that was first. No, I went on loan in, in France, actually. So you it was went a big to move. France and Gillingham, didn't you? Yeah, I went to Gillingham first. Yeah, so um, I went to Gillingham and that was obviously a couple of leagues below. And it was just to get me some game time. And I actually really enjoyed it. But then you know, just know it's not where, where you want to be. be. But it helped because it was like a stepping stone. It just got me games and, yeah. and whatnot. So I went on loan there, came back, and then I went to France, which was a really big kind of... Say so the team name, because I can't pronounce that. ASJ for saw you. Yeah, so <laughs> they, were, they were basically in a relegation battle. Yeah. And um, I'd spoken to Emma Hayes, who's the Chelsea manager. And she was like, yeah, like, go out there and, you know, see... Because she was my academy director. Yes. So I went to Arsenal Academy, so I didn't mention that before. But she was my academy director. And I have had a really, really good uh, relationship with her. And... Um, I asked her, I was like, do you think this is a good move for me? She's like, well, you're going to get games. They're in a relegation battle, so you'll have quite a lot to do. And I remember going out there at a young age and thinking, what have I done? Like, I literally almost, it was like a regret straight away. Like, I just knew that I didn't belong there or I shouldn't have been there. And even though I was trying to, you know, just moving away from home at such a young age yep. was difficult. And then, obviously, playing the standard of, you know, in all due respect, there was in a relegation battle, so the standard of it was really tough to then transition into going from Arsenal and then just like the lifestyle of it, it just wasn't a professional environment. So yeah. I really, really struggled in that environment. And I remember leaving, um, I can't remember how long I was there for, but it was pretty quickly. And I was like, I need to come home. Like I'm done here. And then I came back and went to Birmingham. And I think that was the the move for me that kind of shaped where I'm at now. Yeah. Sure. Like the, it, those sort of journeys though, and the struggles almost of yeah. going to it, getting the frustrations of going on loan and then realizing that this isn't really where I want to be or what I want to be doing yeah. yet. But You've, you've had like, like I said, you, you had a career before a career because you started at 14. So yeah. to spend four, like from 14 to 21, mm -hmm. not really playing, everyone expects you to have already racked up 50, 100 games. Yeah. You've just not had that opportunity because yeah. your age and the, the goalkeeper that was in. Yeah, yeah. And alongside that, obviously I was with playing with England and I had been to like three European championships and I've won one. Yeah. And I've been to like two World Cups at youth level and I'm thinking to myself, but I'm doing all of this, but I'm not playing. Yeah. So I found it difficult to then try and perform, you know, in them environments because I wasn't playing on the weekend. And I thought I need to actually play to give myself the best opportunity. Um, so I felt like it kind of hindered it a little bit because, yeah, I was getting away with it. But then 
I knew I could have been better. Yeah. You know, if I was if I was playing somewhere. More match practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, and like you said, the move to Birmingham seemed like the right time, the right fit, yeah. the right club for you at that time. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you you went there for a short spell first before you went back to Arsenal. Yeah, so it was alone. Um, I just went on loan because I didn't want to leave Arsenal. Yeah. I always imagined myself finishing my career. I know it sounds crazy, but you grow up somewhere and you think that's the club I'm going to be at and that's yeah. it. Um, never looked anywhere else. And when I went to Birmingham, I went on loan and um, I loved it there. We um, I played pretty much every game. Uh, we won the FA Cup. We, <laughs> we was in the Champions League. So like, penalty in final. a... Yeah, like there was just... Sh- so many good things. We had such a great team uh, and the environment was really good. And it's what I just exactly what I needed at that time. Um, and from that, I learned quite a lot. So, yeah. And then obviously when I went back to Arsenal, it was the same scenario again. I wasn't going to get in. So then I made the move permanent to, to Birmingham. And so I think I spent maybe three years there. Yeah. Uh, and like like you said, like when you go on loan and you experience such a high, you won the FA Cup final, you saved a penalty in, in the shootout. Yeah. Like, and then to then drop back down to not playing again and go through those emotions of like, oh, I thought my career was about to kick off. Yeah. And you feel like you get hampered again. But it's, it's so difficult as a goalie because only one of us can play. Yeah. And like, that's the thing that you, you go on the, all these little journeys throughout your career and that. But you, yeah. like, you, again, you, you turn that into a, that adversity into something positive when you move back to Birmingham and yeah. obviously went on to establish yourself quite firmly there. And Yeah, yeah. You seem to have a really good run of games, which obviously... Like you're saying, your, your England career is, a, you didn't mention, uh, <laughs> but you, you played all age groups and yeah. obviously you won the Euros. You didn't let a goal in the whole tournament. Yeah. And you, you know, you go through those kind of, yeah. you know, for the highs and then you go to like a low. Even though I enjoyed being around the Arsenal team and being there, yeah. you know, I didn't deserve to play. I wasn't ready, yeah. you know, for that team because they were just the best. So... I had to respect that. And that's when I obviously then moved on to Birmingham and being there, honestly, it really did change the dynamic of how I thought about things. And, you know, obviously the back of that Birmingham stint, I got injured um, and that's when it opened up even more, you know, thought processes and just getting through big injuries and, you know, trying to work my way around that was another difficult period of my life. What did you do? Um, So I did my PCL at Birmingham um, and, you know, I was relatively injury free. I would pick up little niggles up until that point and, I just remember being in a game and I've gone diving at someone's feet and their shin hit my knee. Yeah. My knee went all the way back and I was on the floor and I was thinking, it doesn't feel quite right. I'm in pain, but I can get up and play. So I tried to get up and they're like, Bex, we need you to get up. Like, we've got five minutes left. And we was in a relegation battle at this point. So I got up and I remember trying to kick a ball and I was like, no, I There's can't do there, it. Yeah. yeah, something's gone. Like, I, I couldn't move. Um, and at the time, I was working at Arsenal in the laundry. Yeah, so, I've um, got all the girls used to work in the laundry. Yeah, yeah. so that was my job. So um, I still had a job there. So um, I remember going back in to, to work the next day and I had like I was limping around and my knee was just ballooned. Hadn't had a scan yet, obviously, nothing like that. Um, but I was just really fortunate because, you know, at Birmingham, the professional side of it was struggling at that point. Um, but obviously, when I went back to Arsenal to work, um, I could have access to the physios. They were all really good. They all looked at me and the doctor. And I have, you know, Vic Akers to thank for that because obviously he gave me the opportunity to be there. And I couldn't thank them enough because that was probably one of the hardest injuries to come back from. Yeah. Almost on my own, but with the support of them, even though they were working with their own squads and, and yeah. doing whatever. I had, you know, the men's staff looking after me as well. Um, and one of my work colleagues would help in the gym and stuff. So really, like, I had to rehab and do quite a lot of that by myself and it was a long stint that I had to stay yeah. out of, of the game for with it. I think I was out for maybe 10 months. Yeah, it's a um, long period out. When you when you feel like you're on your own as well. Yeah, it was hard. Really, really hard. And I was at the end of my contract as well at Birmingham. So it was like, oh my gosh. And, you know, the doctors would be like, oh, we don't know if you're going to come back the same. If you have an operation, you definitely might not even be able to play again. So that was really hard to take. So I thought if I just rehab it and see how it goes and then that's when I moved to Chelsea after that. Yeah. So... You know, I kind of went to Chelsea, but I was still a little bit injured, but they took the risk on taking me there. And from then, that's when things really started to turn good. Yeah, that's amazing, though. But see, like, the the strength that you have mentally then to come Mm. back from an injury while out of contract, because I've been there, like, it's hard. You get into some dark places and you're you're trying to rush your own rehab, but Mm. it's the worst thing to do, but you need to do it, don't you? Yeah, just to be in with a chance to kind of move on. Yeah, exactly, and put yourself back in that shop window. But because... No club really signs an injured, injured player. player. So obviously for Chelsea to take that risk on you. Yeah. yeah, it was it was massive. Um, and obviously it was Emma Hayes that was at Chelsea then. So um, she took a risk and 
you know, I had a, a good couple of seasons there. Um, and again, it was very up and down because I had another injury there as well. Like I just kept picking up little stuff. And um, I think I got into my second season there and I picked up, like I kept getting pains like where a hernia would be. And I just remember like thinking, I can't move. Like I'm not moving very well. And they sent me off to to get, um, I don't know what you call it, exploratory, was it exploratory uh, surgery. Yeah. But they explore and just see what happened. And basically they cut all my nerves. So I can't feel anything no in way. a certain part of my body. Um, Cause I didn't know what it was. Um, and still to this day, I don't know, really know what it was. Um, but wow. now I can't feel anything. So I'm better for <laughs> it. <laughs> um, That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So and obviously, I spent a couple of seasons at Chelsea. So, what you was getting MRI scans and they wouldn't pick anything up? Nothing was coming up. Um, so, the, you know, it is exploratory yeah. surgery. Then yeah. they would open you up, have a look in to see what if yeah. there was anything wrong. They thought it was uh, at first. They thought it was a hernia. But then nothing really was shown for a hernia, and I had so much. Like there was so many different things that I had to go through. Quite a lot of invasive kind of treatments, um, just to try and ease the pain. Like a lot of steroid injections yep. just to see if that was gonna help yep. it and nothing was touching it no way and i just couldn't move like i couldn't get out the car and their symptoms for hernia like you can't stand up properly and i just remember like crouching down after every session thinking i can't move yeah i can't live like this and um yeah i went out to italy i went to um rome for my surgery and i just remember being there and they'd done what they had to do came back from there obviously i was in had to do the rehab afterwards just to straighten my core up again and then I was fine. I haven't felt it since. So it's obviously worked. Whatever they did work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's incredible, that. Yeah, I've yeah. not heard of that, like them cutting the nerves and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Something to do. Apparently it's... there was all tangled. I don't know. They said they was all tangled or whatever. It was a mess. So they just cut it and it just stopped the, the feeling that I was getting. So yeah. I was thinking it must have been something to do with that. But it's I don't amazing know. what we have to put our bodies through, oh, though. <laughs> it is. It is. Obviously. When you say stuff like that. Right. Uh, I'm going to do our quiz before I ca crack on yeah, uh, yeah. with a bit of your career and that. Okay. Huge shout out to Forged Irish Stout for being part of this podcast. Listen to that beauty. An unbelievably smooth, creamy stout by Conor McGregor, the UFC legend. Not here to take part, but here to take over. Forged Irish Stout is on a mission to become the biggest Irish stout. Conor McGregor has taken over the whiskey game. Now he's about to take over the stout game. Me and my guests will be enjoying a few cans in the next few episodes. If you fancy checking it out too, make sure you hit the description below and find out where you can get Forged Irish Stout. Forged Irish Stout will be available in Asda nationwide come August. Let's get back to the podcast. So uh, I've got uh, goalie or no goalie. So I've got five current international goalkeepers in yeah. the women's game. And I've got five other names made up from around the world. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I've got my little scoreboard here because I'm <laughs> terrible at counting. Uh, right. And it's just goalie or no goalie. Just okay. a little simple one, right? Yep. All right. You ready to start? Yep. Right. We'll start with an easy one. Number one, Rebecca Hill. No goalie. Do you know why? Huh? Do you know why? <laughs> I don't know why, but I don't know. <laughs> she is not a goalkeeper. She is actually Becky Hill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Singer okay. Becky Hill. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good start. Nice and easy. <laughs> right. Number two, Patricia Moray. No goalie. She is a goalkeeper. She's a Portugal and Braga goalkeeper. Oh, I thought they had a different one. In. <laughs> <laughs> they had a oh. different one, didn't they? Okay. Apparently the last game, it was Portugal her. played, she played. Right. Number three, Laura Gialiana. Ah. Uh, Giuliani. Goalie. Nice you. She's a goalie. Yeah, she is a goalie. Yeah. I've butchered that. Giuliani, yep. Yep. Laura Giuliani, uh, Inter and AC Milan goalkeeper. All right, number four, Temelade Openiani. Openiani, yeah. Goalie. That's she is nice. not a goalkeeper. <laughs> she is Nigerian singer. Thames. <laughs> Thames. You follow Do her you know as well. What? Oh, don't. You know what's even worse? One of my teammates keeps calling me Thames because my hair. Because your hair. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I've butchered God. the names no, there. I'm no. so bad with names, by the way. My pronunciation. <laughs> I couldn't even get the, the, the French team that you play for. Right. Number five, Jennifer Falk. Goalie. She is a goalkeeper. She is Hacken Sweden. and Sweden goalie. Nice. You're on a roll there. I keep going the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible at this. There we go. Right. Number six, Vera Chocolingham. 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 
No goalie. She is not a goalkeeper. She is uh, the American comedian actress Mindy Kaling. Okay, yeah. Yeah. She was in, um, I'm trying to think of the programme. Do you know the programme that she's in? Do you know the program? Oh, she's in? I, I've yeah. seen a load of films with her in. That's she, gonna annoy me now. She was in Forty Year Old Virgin, I know that. Yeah. She's what been Yeah. Oh, she was in and the American another, office. Yeah, there was another one that she was in. Okay, don't worry. Yep. Right, n- number seven. Chiamaka and Undozi. She's a goalie. She is a goalkeeper. Nigeria. Yes, correct. Paris Nigeria FC. and Paris FC goalkeeper. Yep. Nice you. Yep. Right. Number eight, Elizabeth Grant. No goalie. No, she is not a goalkeeper. That's Lana Del Rey. <laughs> See, I just, never have known that. Yeah, that's yeah. a real name. <laughs> this is like, obviously, it's all a play on words, yeah. a lot of it. Right, number nine. Uh, yeah, number nine, Catalina Jaramillo. Jaramillo. No goalie. She is the Columbia and Brenner, Bremen goalkeeper. God, we swapped shirts after we played. You played her, I didn't played you? played her. In your last international match. First. I didn't know that was her first name. What was it? Uh, Catalina. Catalina, have you got a shirt at home yeah, as well? I That's brilliant. That's even better. <laughs> <laughs> Hope she's not listening. Are you wash your car with it now. So. <laughs> right, and number ten, Karin Johnson. No goalie. She is not a goalkeeper. Is Whoopi Goldberg? Ah, oh. one of my favourite films. Yeah. Sister X. Seven out of ten. That's good scoring. Not too bad, yeah. I can't believe you've got a shirt and you didn't I know her name. I know, that is really, really poor. That's funny, that. that That's poor really poor funny, that. <laughs> right, uh, I was, obviously, you've talked about joining Chelsea and that. Uh, you then moved to West Ham uh, once you did your rehab and you recovered from it. Yeah. So, um, it was kind of a similar scenario. I was up against, you know, the, the goalkeepers at Chelsea are just, that was amazing. I had I was up against Hedvi Lindau. Yeah. Uh, she was the Swedish goalkeeper at the time. And Carly Telford, who was an England goalkeeper. And... Um, I was playing games here and there, um, but still, it just wasn't enough. And I didn't see how that was going to change anytime soon. So I thought, OK, West Ham obviously came calling. They were new to the league um, and they just put some investment into it. So I thought, OK, I can, you know, see how that goes. And I went there and that was a tough, real tough move for me. I think that was, you know, without sounding rude, but it was probably one of the worst moves that one of the worst moves that I had made um, at the time. I didn't enjoy it. Um it was just hard. I found it really difficult. Um, again, it could have been going from such a high to a fresh team. Yeah, again, that's I'm it, not yeah. sure. Um, but I just didn't really enjoy it. Um, Did you know anyone, obviously, you'd worked with before when you went um, to West Ham? Because sometimes it even going from like working with Emma Hayes and like yeah. people you know and you've got that love and trust with to yeah. then move to another club and you're, you're, it's a new yeah. surrounding and new players. and. Yeah. I mean, I knew a lot of the girls, but it was such a new team. Like they, the transfers they had to make in that window was quite a lot because they're competing in one of the best leagues in the world. Yep. So they had to really have quite a big transition themselves. Um, and obviously, being a part of that was great. And Jack Sullivan was the, I think I don't know, he was the chairman or something of the club. So it was a completely different new. And I just did. I just really didn't enjoy it. And I just remember like being there, and I just remember thinking, I'm just not enjoying myself, and I wasn't happy yep. there. Um, and then at the end of that, I think I just asked, I had another year left on my contract, but I think um, it was a mutual agreement, I think, between me and the manager. And I just said, like, it's not working. Yeah. Um, and that's when I went to Tottenham. But it's, it's, it, like, even that, like, it's so grown up of you to, to go, yeah. like, look, I'm just not enjoying it. This isn't where I want to be. Yeah. And, like, it's hard sometimes because you obviously contractually you, you're yeah. tied in or you're like, uh, this. Every time you move clubs, you're like, I've got to make this the, the one that works and play as many yeah. games as I can. But sometimes it just don't work like that. Yeah, and it's hard because I used to get quite a lot of stick on social media for the amount of clubs that I'd been at, but nobody really understands what I'd been through. And, um, you know, it was only I've only moved clubs just to get the t- playing time that I need. Um, and for that move, that was exactly what I was moving for. And even that, I played, you know, I think the first half of the season and I got dropped and didn't play. After a couple of, you know, I had a couple of bad games. I think it was a, another Man City game where we had got smashed like 6-1. And I remember coming back from that game just really like downbeat. And I was just like, oh, like, I don't know how this is going to get better. And, you know, when your confidence goes, motivation just goes completely. Yep. And I thought, I can't be here. Like, this has to be, it's time for me to move on already. Yep. Um, obviously, I'd like to stay loyal to a club. But then, obviously, people from the outside in looking at it going, oh, she's leaving after a year. But then I'm not seeing the fact that I'd been at Arsenal from the age of, you know what I mean? Like eight to the age of 22. Yeah. So like, that's all I've ever wanted. It was just to be at a home and, and stay there. Yeah, just based. And just, yeah, and just have my base set up. So, you know, that was a really tough move for me. Obviously, everything happens for a reason. And I'm quite a, a great believer in that. Um, 
but yeah, I just had to make a decision. I definitely made the right one for for everyone that was involved at yeah, the time. But that's a, one of the biggest things about being a goalkeeper. There's only ever one of you that can play. Mm-hmm. There's two or three, four in a squad, yeah. and, and you've got to know that your role almost. And it's hard when you, especially when you're chasing games. And yeah. I've done it myself. I've moved. I've moved a lot of clubs, but it's yeah. only because I ever was. If, if I felt like I was becoming stagnant yeah. or I weren't getting the game time that I felt like I, I either deserved or wanted, yeah. I, I felt like I had to move on. It, it weren't sometimes no fault of my own. It was yeah. just situations and scenarios change. Yeah. And also as well, like if, you know, your manager one minute can can really love you and, and whatnot and the next minute they just are just not having you. And I think it's just, it's just part of the game. And I think yeah. it happens with outfield players as well. But the beauty for them is that, you know, if they're on the bench, they've still got a, you know, relatively high chance of coming on, especially as a striker or, or whatnot. But as a goalkeeper, you're waiting for an injury to happen, otherwise you're not going to come on that field. So, um, yeah, it's, it is tough when you're in that moment where you don't know whether you're coming or whether you're going in, yeah. in a situation and, you know, you're not playing and then you just, you know, increasingly you just start to get really unhappy in, in yourself. Um, and it's hard to kind of switch it and, and to find positives. And you go into training every day wanting to do your best and wanting to be great around the team and, and I think it's something that we've spoken about it before. We've probably been very good at. And um, but you know that that's not your job, yeah. really. You can do it, but yeah. it's not your role, you know, your main role. You want to play. So I think trying to find the balance with that is sometimes really hard. That's a, the one thing that I've found is that the more honest that a manager is with me, if they tell me that's my role, I can then do that to the best of my ability because yeah. it's like a job title change. It's like mm-hmm. if you get told, right, you're not going to play every game, but I want you to do this mm. during the week and I want you to set standards and I want you on a match day to be the most encouraging But You then go, well, that's why I'm here. Yeah. But if you're getting brought into a club and you're getting told, no, you're going to be our number one, yeah. we're going to have someone competing with you and then you lose your place, you're like, well, my job was to be the number one. Yeah. I'm not doing that now. That I was here to be that person. Yeah. It's hard to get your head around it as well, I think. And Obviously, if you do have like a run of games where you're not performing very well and you deserve it to come out of the team, you're like, okay, I deserve that one. But sometimes it can just change. You know, I can talk about the situation I had at Tottenham uh, not so long ago under the the old manager that we had. We would play games uh, suited to us. Um, which I, it was hard. That's difficult. That. It worked uh, for the, the first season, but then it become increasingly difficult because you couldn't get a run of games and you couldn't build any momentum on what you were doing because you could be taken out in the next game just for no real reason of your, like, not because you've done anything wrong, but just because it suited the other goalkeeper's traits. Um, That's and a bizarre I find that situation. Really, it's hard. It's a really tough one. Um, and it was hard to get your head around because um, then you just you're always up in the air and it's just no consistency in what you're doing and it's difficult and I think it does work but I don't think it works for very long. So they were basing it on like tactically so like like we've talked about you love playing out from the back but let's yeah. say the other goalkeeper likes to kick it long. Yeah. Depending on the opposition yeah. they, he, they were picking the goalkeeper for the best for that game. For that game. That's crazy Even really. if you've had a worldie in you the could game have had, before. You could have got player a match before you could still be at risk of coming out the next game. So it me- mentally, it was really tough because you didn't know when it was happening, but you could kind of gauge what games it was going to be in. Because they don't talk to you that week. Yeah, and then, then you would be like, oh gosh, and you'd be like, okay, I've got Arsenal this week or I've got a really high crossing team this week, so that might not be what I'm going to yeah. Or And it was just hard because you're thinking, but we still have to be a goalkeeper regardless of what game it is. Yep. You still have to have an all-round you have to be good at every little Everything, yeah. thing that you're doing. You can have your super strengths, but you've got to be an all-rounder to yeah. be a good goalkeeper. So that's when, when I kind of found it difficult because I'm like, no, because I am good at that. But, you know, I might not have been exposed to that in that game or, you know, I might not be as good at it as she is, but she's not as good as... On the other things, yeah, yeah of course, so yeah. It's like, Swings and roundabouts. Yeah, and I found that it was hard. It was tough going. Yeah. But um, it does work. I think yeah. it does work a little bit, but... It's not sustainable. Yeah. You know, well, as we've mentioned anyway, you're, you're currently at Spurs and yeah. you're having a really successful period and you've played a lot of games for the club. Yeah. It's obviously a, a, a club that is growing itself in the women's game, mm-hmm. but you seem to have flourished from that anyway. Yeah, yeah. So when I joined Spurs, they just got promoted um, into the WSL. And again, it was like another transition moment for them as a club, as a whole, um, just to see how much they would need to change and just the professionalism of our league and yeah. the demands it and you know the players that you're going to have to get in to compete um so I've been on a bit of a journey with with Tottenham um and it's been nice you know we started off at the hive you know Barnett's ground um <laughs> we trained you know on the public pitches that were outside there for a, a little while um and obviously now we're basically at least doing, it wasn't under hill because that was a big hill yeah that was a that was tough <laughs> I was playing the cup game there and I was thinking cool this is a 
a tough go. But yeah, you know, we played at the Hive um, and then we transitioned over to Tottenham where we've got our own facilities there now. Um, so I've obviously been on that journey and it's been nice to see it because you've been a part of it and you can then measure up where you've been and where you are now. And, you know, I think in the maybe the third season that I was there or maybe second season, I think we ended up, I want to say, fifth in the league, which is quite a big thing, you know, for us. And we beat, you know, some good teams and we drew against some top teams as well, which was like something really good for momentum shift. Um, and obviously this season we've got a new manager. So, you know, things have changed again. Um, but I think it's changed for the better yeah. um, in terms of now where the club wants to go and everyone's on this journey now of you know, wanting to be able to compete with the top four teams. So um, I don't think it will be before long before we're up there. Yeah, I feel like, obviously, I'm a Tottenham fan, by the way. Yeah. So like I, I follow all the teams, youth teams and everything. That I can see that you're starting to bridge the gap between that, and which is obviously quite similar to the first team, really, and the men's team is that like, yeah. we'd all love them to, to get a lot closer, and they have done recently. And it, yeah. the club itself, just even with the new manager in the men's, mm. just seems to be, everything seems to be pulling together. Yeah, and I think we're kind of mirroring what the men are doing. So obviously with Ange there, he's brought a different style of play into the club. And with Robert, our manager, who's just come in, he also likes that style of play. So, you know, having managers like that in the club is, you know, has been detriment to how well, you know, we've performed this season. Yep. Um, so, you know, I think it's like a, a one club mentality. So we've got a coach called um, Simon Davis who works with the academy um, and he does all the style of plays and, and whatnot. And he worked with us last year for a small period and he comes to watch us um, this season, you know, just every now and again, he comes to watch just to see how we're trying to implement what, you know, is set out for That's the whole club. Yeah. Um, so there is a connection in terms of that. And um, yeah, we're all enjoying it because there's a lot of freedom with what we're doing. Yeah. So it's been, it's been great so far. Uh, and you've said that you've now got Perry as goalkeeper coach. Yes. The legend yeah, <laughs> Perry Sucklin. He is, yeah, he's one of a kind. Yeah. Um, and like I said to you before, it's just something, you know, at my age, obviously I'm 32. Um, so I'm getting older now and he brings something that I kind of needed at this point in my career. And he's just opened my eyes up to, you know, just doing the basics very, very well. It's something that I always wanted to do anyways and something that I've always pride myself off. Yeah. Um, but with him coming in, he's really kind of, you know, motivated me to, to keep doing that because that's, you know, a really good way to go. So, yeah, he's been amazing. Yeah. So obviously you started your career with Alex Welsh and Perry yeah. and Alex are like two of a kind. Aren't they? <laughs> They're like the same person. And it's like, like the, the enthusiasm yeah. that they have for goalkeepers and goalkeeping yeah. is incredible. So yeah. being able to work with Perry, I've spoke to Perry a lot and I think he's just a, a, a class guy as well. Yeah. But, and just as a person, like just as a human being, yeah. because people forget about the human side of the game yeah. and treating people as a human being and just having like little, you know, talks with him and just, you know, I don't know, he's like a soundboard as well for me and equally I am for him. So like if he needs to know something or if he wants to find out something about, you know, the women's game, for example, he would ask me and, you know, we can always bounce off ideas off each other and yep. stuff. And it's really nice to have that kind of relationship with a goalkeeping coach, which is kind of hard to find. Yeah, it, it's so important to have that kind of relationship yeah. with a goalkeeper coach, but it's not always the case. Yeah, it's not always And easy. like we, we've, uh, we've both gone through careers where you get on with some and you don't get on with others. But yeah. at the end of the day, you, you, you're all working in that same department. You still have a mutual respect for each other, yeah, which yeah. is sometimes it is hard. Yeah. But obviously when you find one that you love, like a Perry, it, yeah. it, makes, it makes every day a lot more entertaining and easier yeah. and enjoyable as yes. well you know because even say for example if you're not playing you know that you're going in working with that person you can kind of enjoy going in and looking forward to to training yeah for us if you you know if you're not playing and you're going for a bit of a rough patch and then you've got a goalkeeping coach that's not you know kind of your cup of tea it's kind of hard then to yeah. to get motivated yeah 100 so. percent. right I, I want to go on to your international career obviously we've talked about your youth international career yeah uh, and obviously representing england at literally every age group and winning the euros and stuff yeah. like that yeah. um you you received a, a full international call up but obviously was on the bench against estonia yeah was that obviously amazing but also a little bit that you you felt like you were so close to it yeah it was um I felt like I was so close, but I also had a, you know, when I thought about it afterwards, I didn't feel like I'd belong, I didn't belong there so much. I didn't feel like it was the right fit for me. I feel like, you know, sometimes when you're in a place, like I said, with the West Ham, you just know that it's not you. Um, and I had conversations with the manager at the time and I didn't feel valued. Um, and I think that was probably one of my biggest things I remember there was a Euros and I was at Chelsea at the time and the squad was coming out and I didn't get selected um and I was playing for Chelsea at the time um and I was having a good you know run of games yep. and I was involved with the senior team like consistently at this point 
And I remember having the conversation with my, with the manager at the time who um, we spoke about why I didn't get selected. And he asked me, what I what have you done to be selected? Or you haven't done anything. And I just remember just turning around. And I was thinking, I've actually won everything that there is to win in this, you know, yeah. in the game yeah. so far. Like, yeah. I've been a part of some amazing squads. Like, I've been a part of that. I've won everything. I've done everything. And I just thought, I'm not valued. I'm not really appreciated. This is not, this is not it. So after that, I didn't get caught. I got, obviously got injured again and I didn't get called up after that. That yep. was me done. And then obviously in 2021, you got your call up for Jamaica. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a strange one. I, um, cause I'd never grown up. I'd never heard of the Jamaica national team. I never knew that they, you know, that yep. that was there. And I think still now the younger generation wouldn't know that yep. up until this point of them being involved in the world cup. Yes. Um, so I didn't know that was a pathway that I could even go down. And I remember the last World Cup previously that Jamaica qualified for. Um, I just couldn't get my paperwork done. So I would have gone oh, to that, right, okay. but I couldn't get my paperwork done. And I think it was at the point where I was leaving West Ham. So it was probably for the best that I didn't go anyhow. Because um, I was just trying to mentally sort myself out ready for a new move. Um, but yeah, I got my call up for Jamaica and I haven't looked back. I've enjoyed every single minute of it. Yeah, obviously the World Cup was a very successful one for yourself. And obviously the, the squad getting out of the group and stuff like that. And when... Obviously, it weren't expected to, really. Yeah. Yeah, we did have the group of death, as what they call yep. it. And because we're so underfunded and um, we don't have the resources and, you know, the way we're treated is pretty tough. Um, we don't get everything yep. that we want. And um, moving into that World Cup, once the group came out, I remember looking at the group and I thought, God, like, this is going to be tough. Yep. Like, wh whatever's going to happen, it happens. But I remember, like, we had a belief in, you know, in our changing room that we said we're going to qualify and we're going to get out of the group. And that was it for the whole of the World Cup. We knew, I could, you know, when you can just get a sense of a feeling. You're building that mentality. Yeah, in. because we don't get what everyone else gets. And we're always the underdog. And I'm like, we're the underdogs in this. We've got Brazil. We've got France. We've got Panama in our group. Okay, so you've got two top 10 teams that you've got to play against. Um, you know, how are we going to navigate this? And I didn't know how we were going to be. Um, so we just went there. We, we just went to the World Cup and we just went for it. Yeah. And we just had nothing to lose and we just believed in each other. Um, and you can just see from like, the performances that we all just stuck together and we were doing it for each other because it wasn't just about us, but it was about you know young Jamaican footballers and young black footballers as well that don't f see a pathway that they can you know kind of go on. Yeah. And there is one there. Is that obviously like we're saying, uh, obviously you haven't been treated right from the Jamaican uh, Football Federation. Yeah. Is that hard because of the, all the work that you did at the World Cup and it was so positive and obviously like you're saying about inspiring like young black people from the commu like those communities and yeah. to then almost be taken away straight away is a difficult one. You're saying you're not going to the Olympics. Yeah, I mean, we obviously came off the back of the World Cup and it was all buzzing. Like we was all happy and Jamaica was going wild. Like we, they were just so proud of us. And I remember coming back and we had Canada um, pretty soon after. I think it was in September. And it's kind of like, you know, when you don't want that game to be there because it's Olympic qualifying. We didn't want it to be there because none of us had been playing at this point. I think it was like, or people were just started to get in their seasons. And we've got, in Jamaica, there's loads of players playing all over the world. So we didn't know how we were going to prepare for that game. Yep. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of going around about payments and stuff like that. But we went to that game, we lost. Um, and then since that point, we haven't been back since. So we've kind of gone from a massive high where everyone's celebrating us to then a low to now for us not being involved at all because yep. us as players had to stand together to try and stand up for something for the next generation coming through. So uh, as a group of players, you've all c uh, come together and agreed this. Then. Yeah. So it's the, it's the current World Cup squad that was at, you know, at the World Cup. We kind of said to ourselves, like, we cannot do this anymore. Like, when does it stop? Like, when can we just, you know, when do we voice our opinions? Because we've been re relatively quiet about stuff um, because we just wanted to concentrate on ourselves. Um, and, you know, the Jamaican Federation have been very vocal, even without us saying anything. Um, and there's just been a lot of blame culture going on. And it's not something that we wanted to create, but we had to stand together as a team just to we need to shine a light on it and yep. just to show that because it's not just our federation that I like it. You know, there's other countries that are also struggling the same as us. Yep. Um, and we just wanted to, you know, build that platform so other countries feel that they can do it as well. Yeah. Do you think the stance going forward will show like obviously the unity that you do have and the strength that they, yeah. they will have to start to look at themselves now? Yeah. Um, and it's positive. Obviously, I'm in the leadership group, at, you know, with Jamaica and um, we've had a lot of conversations that have been kind of positive with the federation and we've spoken about everything but we're still not there yet um so for us we we're all keen to get back in 
to play in and do what we do best because we didn't qualify for the Gold Cup either. Yep. And it was such a shame. Obviously, they had to put a field a team that wasn't the World Cup players. So it was always going to be difficult because these players had never even trained together before. Yep. So it's just such a shame because, you know, we also it's at a detriment to where we want to be. But then at the same time, we had to do something for something to change. Yep. And we just hope now that this is going to create a change sooner rather than later. Yeah, hopefully then. Fair play. It's yeah. amazing what you're trying to do yeah. and what you're trying to achieve. So like, good luck to you. Yeah, thank you. Right. Uh, that's the serious stuff out of the way yeah. now. Right. Can we talk some geeky glove stuff? Yeah, right. Yeah, go for so it. obviously uh, you've brought your gloves in today, right? Yeah. What gloves do you wear? You, you obviously say. Yeah. One glove. Um, you've been I've with been... the one glove your whole career, you've said. Yeah. You? So I've been wearing them for about, I'm going to say about 10 years now. Um, and I've tried all the other uh, gloves and when one glove came, yeah, I've been on a journey with them, you know, just seeing where they've started off and where they are now, but I don't think I could ever change gloves now. And yours are totally custom made for you, aren't they? Yeah. So, um, I've got a different latex on mine. It's a softer latex. I was latex. feeling they are soft, aren't they? Yeah, it's a softer latex. Um, I've They're got thicker a... as well. Yeah. So these gloves don't, I think, um, so these are a hybrid cut as well. Yep. Um, and I'm used to like a thicker glove that I like um, and I've changed the the straps as well of mine um, to what the normal model is Yep. just because it just fits my hand better so the guys at One Glove and Miles I've got them to thank because yeah, uh, I've spoke to Miles a few times and that and Miles is unbelievable about his knowledge about gloves and oh. uh, about how obviously he's trying to spread the brand but he also just wants the product to be unbelievable yeah and the amount of care like honestly I couldn't fault these gloves like I just love them I couldn't think of wearing anything else and They've put so much work and hard work into into the quality of the yep. glove um, and obviously making them affordable for, for people as well, which yep. is something that's really massive because some gloves are really expensive these days. So for like younger keepers, I think it's a, it's massive for them. But yeah, I can't go anywhere else. These are... We were talking about this off air as well, but like uh, the importance of just being happy in your gloves is so important. Oh. And like for, for the younger ones coming through and yeah. young, young boys and girls, just find a pair of gloves that you feel the best in. It doesn't matter if they're the best gloves or the yeah. cheapest or the most expensive. Just find ones that you think, yeah. I feel really good in these. That's yeah. all it is. Exactly. And it's not even about the look of gloves either. I mean, these are a great design, but I never really went for the look of it. Because I, when I was younger, I used to wear night gloves quite a lot. And then I just used to think they're not really my kind of doesn't really fit me very yep. well and, and stuff like that. But obviously with one glove, obviously they can make the gloves for me. But, you know, you can just find different models and you can just play around with it for a little while until you find the ones that you do like. Yep. Um, and I found mine now. So. Yeah. What size are you? Uh, eight. You are an eight, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You've got quite big hands, really. You think so? Yeah, well... Uh, some of like the, the the men's team, like we've got a, uh, one of our goalies wears a size eight. I'm in a size eleven, and I find that like him having a size eight hand is yeah. crazy compared. Well, maybe his hands are just small. Yeah. I'm never, yeah, size eight. Yeah, but a fair play. Right? <laughs> uh, do you, when you get a new pair of gloves, do you break them in at all, or do you, are you happy enough to just go straight into a game with them? Depends how I feel. Sometimes I do the whole pre-wash thing. Yeah. Miles would get onto me about this, but I do like a pre-wash and. Um, yeah, Do not I'd use a washing machine. No, Please, no. no one listen. I used to, though. Did you? Oh, I used to. Horrible. And it, used to, it used to keep like a bit of grip at some point, but not with these. I never used to do it with these. Yeah. But a good pre-wash. I'll do a couple of sessions in them. Yeah. I'm happy to go. Yeah. Have you got superstitions about your gloves? Not in particular. I do, if I'm playing a game, so when I was at the World Cup or even now at club, I don't walk out with my gloves. I give them to the kit man. So I have my little towel my gloves and my drink and I give it to the kit man. You don't want to shake hands with anyone with your gloves on? No, and then I'll go out, do all of that and then once I take my jacket off or whatever, then I'll put my gloves on whilst everyone else is doing their little last runs or By whatever. the way, how hard is it to take a jacket off with your gloves oh, on? God, that's why I don't do that, it. It probably <laughs> makes sense that, yeah. Uh, and obviously, uh, I want to talk to you about conditions and stuff. Obviously, yeah. Like you're saying, sometimes you're happy to wear new gloves, sometimes you're not. It all depends on the weather conditions, doesn't it? Because it really they're so different. I, yeah. And this is one of the biggest things. Wearing a pair of gloves, a new pair of gloves in the rain is tricky. Pretty. It's, it's probably one of the worst yeah. things you can do. But the latex on these are actually made for the wet. Yeah. But even still, when they're new, a slippy surface, you're, you're struggling. Yep. It's a struggle, I think, for all. I think it's an ongoing joke. With it, yeah, it is, yeah. The, GK the old soapy gloves. New, yeah, it just slips it's through. A, it's the powder they come off from the factory. Yeah. And then you, you need to, that's why you pre-wash pre and you have oh. to look after your gloves. It's this awesome. is one of the, I, I always tell people, you've got to look after your tools of your trade. Like, yeah. And like looking after your gloves is paramount. I hate it when goalkeepers come out with dirty gloves for training. Yeah. It just looks terrible. But I think it's the grounding from like an Alex Welsh or a yeah. Perry that... It's, it's old school. It's like, no, do it right yeah. and the rest will take care of itself. And sometimes if I see, 
if someone's gloves are really getting worn away, I'm like, I can't, how, like, how are you catching it with yeah. like, like that? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm like you. Yeah. I, yeah. You've got to look after him. Right. Yeah. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about preparing for games and pre match sort of stuff. So, yeah. uh, do you, uh, have you found routines that do work for you, routines that don't work for you? I think it's forever changing. Obviously, with pre match and stuff now, um, they've changed it this year at Tottenham where we meet at the ground and have pre match together yeah. and then get a coach even to home games. So, they've changed that. Because I used to just eat at home and then just go straight to the game yeah. and have a, quite a big lion because I love my sleep. So <laughs> that's definitely something for me. Not having to set an alarm is one of my big, one of my favourite things. So, <laughs> um, no, for me, I'm quite a chilled character. I'm always one of the last ones off the bu off the coach. That's probably one of my only things that I'd really do. That's superstition wise. But as preparation goes, I'm pretty calm. I don't yeah. really think about the game too much. Um, I'm just very laid back anyway. So I feel like I find it sometimes. I actually find it difficult to get excited or really nervous for a game um you know some people are always buzzing or I, I, I think that's a sign of a good goalkeeper though because yeah. you're, you're that composure that you have should pass off that you're calm behind them and it's yeah. it, it rubs off on people i always find that the the over enthusiastic goalkeepers yeah. are a bit wired or a bit tapped and you're like are they on edge or is that how they get going yeah. I, I find that strange i'm yeah I, I like to sit in the dressing room 10 20 minutes before kickoff on my own yeah like so i warm up early but then go in early yeah just to like chill out just really chill out because i'm similar to that as well like i'll do a warm-up and because it's like you said everyone's different and my warm-up is i'll have breaks in between mine all the time but mine's a quite a simple warm-up breaks in between and i'll like to go in early before everyone else comes in before it all starts getting loud again because i just like to just sit there yeah. and just be on my own for a little bit and like you said you just like to just gather your last thoughts before you go out and yeah. before everyone else comes but in. It's, it's those moments where you're not rushing but you get to relook over the penalty takers and yeah. you get to look at the set pieces and stuff like that and you just yeah. like they're refreshers aren't they but yeah. that, that's you just preparing right to so that you feel the part to go out but you're also you, your game knowledge is improving because you're at that key moment you're going right no this is my job this is what i need to do and how can i help the team by learning this and yeah yeah no exactly and like i said i just i love the piece as well and when everyone else starts it starts to get chaotic and then yeah. all, like, all of a sudden you rush i hate being rushed yeah that's, that's the worst i hate that as well you know, I a bit late to a game sometimes and you're thinking goalkeepers go out early and i'm thinking I ain't got long, you know, until I've got to be out there. Yeah. I like to just take my time for everything. So uh, in your warm up as well, then, uh, do you do a lot? Do you do you like to get a sweat on or because yeah, it's, it's, no. I'm exactly the same. <laughs> a, a, a warm up for a goalkeeper should be a gradual like uh, rise towards kickoff. It, yeah. Like I find that some goalkeepers that will do like a loads of diving and like loads of high intensity work that. They're eventually they're going to keep peaking and then hit a low and then they're going to have to then try and find the medium to kick off again yeah where i like to like build into it so that it's building towards kickoff yeah see like the shooting usually is one of my biggest things sometimes i don't go in at all yep. for the shooting because i'm like getting up getting down getting up getting down you're just constantly doing it and they're just like pelting balls at you and i think i don't need that at this point and then sometimes i think oh i'll go in for a couple but it might just be five and then that will be it but everything is very calm i don't do it much big diving I don't do it's always very basic stuff um don't like to really get a sweat on in it and just go inside come out and then I'll feel ready but like you said other goalkeepers love you know because yeah. you know I have a goalkeeper at Tottenham she's completely different to me but she loves doing the whole warm-up so she would do absolutely everything, yeah, everything and I won't do anything so she loves to do that but else I like to swap with her and we can both get a little bit you know do, do you tailor that to like different oppositions uh no so what is in me going with the shooting or as in like obviously if you know you're going to have more game involvement you're going to you know, face more shots or you're going to face more crosses or you're going to do more uh, passing out from the back more distribution will you concentrate on that or you just it's a routine you yeah, just go through the same, same things and it'll be match day minus one if yep. i need to you know do anything extra with that then i'll do it then yeah for sure yeah i like to keep the same thing right perfect uh Oh, the the final thing I wanted to ask you, obviously, in correlation to women's game, do you get frustrated with the comments that are passed on to goalkeepers, especially? Yeah, because um, it's been going on for years. So I'm just, you, you know, you just become used to it. Yeah. Um, and even if you do do well, you're still not going to get the credit you probably The plaudits that you do deserve, yeah. Yeah, so it's just one of them things. I think it's always going to be around. I mean, I think the World Cup especially showed the quality of goalkeepers, how, you know, a lot of goalkeepers, especially in the WSL that were at the World Cup, who did amazing um, and I think that's, you know, credit to us because we just keep going and it's our job at the end of the day and you can't play a game without a goalkeeper. Yep. So 
they're stuck with us whether they like us or they don't yeah. but i do get frustrated because there's been so many comments that you get and you just think you just got to ignore it and it's sometimes it's hard um i think because you know especially if you haven't had, had a good game and then sometimes you'll see like the odd comment or say oh do you see what that person said and i'm like i don't really care yeah. but then you end up sometimes looking at it and you think god make the goal smaller goal women's goalkeepers aren't good enough they can't even kick they can't do this you can't do that but they're not looking at the goalkeeper as a whole as a and whole. they're not goalkeepers themselves. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point is that because they don't understand what we do, it's yeah. easy for them to just throw away a comment yeah. of like, oh, the goalies are too small or the goals are too big for them. Mm -hmm. and Like they just throw away comments from someone that's uneducated about our position. Yeah. And that, that's, a, I, even I find it hard when I hear these comments because I, I, I'm the world's worst. I can't watch football on TV anymore because of what yeah. the commentators might say about a goalkeeper of going, oh, I can't get beat at the near post. But, you don't understand the breakdown of why they got beaten at the near yeah. post or it doesn't matter where you are, where you're facing. It's still a four yard goal that you're trying to defend, yeah. whether that's yeah. on the angle or straight anyway. Yeah. And, there's, and there could be smack, like you just, it's, there's just so much we have to kind of think about. And even outfield players, they will never understand the processes that we have to go through. Like I said, we're a different breed. We have to like be present all the time and focus on so many different elements of the game that yep. they don't have to do. Um, and I feel like the position is very underrated in that and, if you've never played a minute in goal, you're never going to understand it. Yeah, you just um, don't. You know, and it's hard. Yeah. It's, it is. It's really tough. It's probably the hardest position on the pitch. Yeah, but uh, especially in goalkeeping, people only ever focus on the, the negative comments anyway. Yeah. So obviously in the women's game, they will look at one clip of a goalkeeper getting lobbed or something, but they yeah. won't see the whole game as a like yeah. going, oh, what she did do well. But the, it's the same in the men's game. If, if I make a mistake in a game, yeah. it's all people are going to remember after the game. Yeah. It's just, it's easier, I find, that the comments in the women's games are a lot worse. Yeah, we just get it all the time. And I just think to myself, if I like the make the goal smaller or she's too small, she shouldn't be in goal, yeah. she gets lobbed or she does this. And I was thinking, well, I am five foot five. Um, so I am short as a goalkeeper, but I've been playing in the in this league for 10 years now. Exactly. And, and you've won a lot of <laughs> trophies, <laughs> yeah, you know so what I mean? Right. I can't be doing too bad. You exactly. Know? Um, but I'm just happy that the quality of goalkeeping is getting better. And like I said, we didn't have the resources in the women's game before to have goalkeeping yep. coaches. So a lot of goalkeeping, uh, goalkeepers now in the women's game have only recently started getting, you know, goalkeeping coaching. Yep. So it's understandable that, you know, sometimes the quality might not be there from younger ages. But as as you can see now, it's getting much better. So I'm just, you know, proud of us as, yep. as, a, as a union to... Oh. To keep pushing along. Exactly. No, full credit to you. Uh, what's your release away from football? Um, so I've got a close, I'm close with my family. So uh, every Friday I go around, that's my day off. Um, I'll go around there to my parents' house and meet up with all my family. I've got nine nieces and nephews as well. Wow, big um, family. And I'm one of five. So um, yeah, we just enjoy each other's company and we can just talk about each other's weeks and everyone's got something different to talk about. And uh, my niece is... Uh, GB pole vaulter as well. So she's hoping to go to the Olympics this, oh, incredible. Uh, this year. So, you know, we kind of like talk about all different stuff and yeah, it's just nice just to be around them. And I just like, I like spending quite a lot of time by myself as well. I'm quite a, I like to just be at peace. I think once I go home from training, I like to just put Netflix on and just chill. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then final question. I ask this at the end of every show, but what does the goalkeepers union mean to you? I mean, it means everything. I think, you know, because we're always in it and, um, you know, we're such a small group of, you know, people. And obviously at training, there's only like, well, sometimes you'll get five of you or whatever, but you have to stick together because, you know, we're against we're against it all the yeah. time. So, yeah, the, the GK Union is, is a special place. Yeah, it's sure. a special place. <laughs> right, uh, what an episode. Becky, thank you so thank much you. for coming on. I've really enjoyed this. I no uh, really yeah. enjoyed the chat. And obviously so inspiring, like I said, for, for the next generation of young female footballers. Uh, so f amazing work. Well done. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Uh, I need to say a massive thank you to uh, the podcast sponsors. This has been the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard. Please make sure you're following and subscribe. Thanks a lot, guys. What a save from Mark Howard. <laughs>